Hello and welcome to Spotlights. This is the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. And this week, I'm really happy to welcome onto the show, Vijaya Nagarajan. Vijaya, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's a delight to be here. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, definitely. Um, you're a, a colleague of mine at the University of San Francisco, and you're really a, a groundbreaking figure in the field of religion and ecology. And uh, you're an assistant professor in the Theology and Religious Studies Department, and in associate the professor. associate professor, that's yeah. important. <laughs> that's okay. Um, <laughs> and also in the environmental studies program. So you're really working across uh, the exact fields that the field of religion ecology is about, right? Theology and religious studies on one hand, environmental studies on the other. Mm -hmm. And you do some really interesting teaching and speaking and writing uh, across things like Hinduism, ecology, gender, ritual. Uh, so I want to hear a little bit more about what your work is, especially about the book you had come out recently, Feeding a Thousand Souls, Women, Ritual, and Ecology in India, an Exploration of the Kolam. So tell us a little bit, what's this book about? Yeah, so this is the book. Um, it's called Feeding a Thousand Souls, as you said. And as you see the picture, it's a, I don't know if you, the light is out there, that's better, I think. Um, this is a street in Tamil Nadu, in the state of Tamil Nadu, which is in southeastern India. Um, and this is a practice for the festival Pongal, uh, which literally means in Tamil to boil over, for rice to boil over. Um, and this is almost like a rice boiling over of designs beyond the threshold of the house. Um, and these are designs that, that are called kolam, and they're made by over 20 million women every morning. Um, and it's a, over a thousand year old ritual that we know of, um, although there's also Vedic references to designs done for the sun god that go back to 1200 BCE. Um, but they're more from male voices and they're not specifically gendered, um, but at least the idea of designs on the ground, on the earth to honor the sun god, which is also part of the reason that the kolam is also done. Yeah, so it's something that it's interesting um, you know, Tamil Nadu is where it's done every single day, but all through India, there's many, there are many names for this ritual. Um, and so you have Rangoli in North India, you have Mugu in Andhra Pradesh, you have Alpana, it's called in Bengal, uh, in West Bengal, and you have um, Mandana in Rajasthan, and so on. So you have almost every region has its own name for these women's ritual design traditions. But Tamil Nadu, as far as I know, is the only place that it's done every morning. Um, and it's traditionally done before sunrise, although now pe with people watching Netflix and you know late night TV, that's harder to get people up at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> it was easier to do when you didn't have electricity yeah. because you just went to sleep at sunset and you woke up right before sunrise. Um, but, you know, one could think about almost three to 400 million Hindu women doing some kind of parallel women's ritual art form to the kolam during some parts of the calendric year, you know, for Diwali, for example, or Navaratri or, you know, different festivals. So it's really, this is the first book in English. Um, and who knows, like, if it's the first because, you know, the world is a big place, but one of the first. Um, of really trying to understand the philosophical underpinnings of oral and visual knowledge of women, of Hindu women. So, um, and because I've been involved with the whole Hinduism and ecology field, even in a sense before its creation in the scholarly world. So, in fact, my history goes back to 1985. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, in 1981, I went back as an undergraduate to do an internship on cow dung oh, wow. um, and biogas plants because I was right between engineering and economics at that time. And so, of course, I knew that cow dung was sacred. So, but I was really looking at the kind of energy efficiency of cow dung and in terms of biogas plants. But my real work with religion and ecology began with the Ganga. You know, I worked with a, a nonprofit organization called Swacha Ganga Campaign in Benares and Friends of the Ganges, it was called in San Francisco. And so I was sort of the San Francisco branch of that organization. And I did a lot of public educational events and research on alternative sewage treatments. And that's where I 
to clean up the Ganga, which is, of course, not a one lifetime activity, but right. multiple lifetimes. <laughs> it, it took multiple lifetimes to get there. Um, but that's when I really became aware of sometimes the contradictions between uh, religion and ecology. Like we tend to think at the first level that if we, if a religious tradition frames the ecology or environment as sacred, that that automatically is enrolled in the project of environmentalism as we understand it in the Western, right. you know, epistemological discourse. But what I discovered, um, you know, as an activist um, doing this work was that in fact, the very nature of the Ganga River as a goddess is what prevented many Hindus from realizing that the river, the concrete material, materiality of the river itself couldn't be protected by that mythic layer, that right. it still was materially polluted, you know? Yeah, so but that was such a, such a deep contradiction to the mythic belief yeah. that it was, it was almost, um, it, it, it created a disbelief, like, a, you know, even confronting the fact of, uh, you know, of the, of the intense pollution. So this is what, you know, um, Mishra Ji, who was the founder of Sankat Manshan Foundation, you know, spoke really movingly and, and really with tears about, you know, he was a Brahmin priest and he was a civil engineer. So he could see both, but he and his whole life work was to convey that, that duality, you know, to Hindus along the river, to some success and to some failures. And so that's when I, that's when I first felt the kernel of that field. Mm -hmm. And then in 1994, there was a panel at, at uh, the American Academy of Religion. I was a grad student at Berkeley mm -hmm. in South Asian studies and anthropology and art history um, and Tamil language and literature. And I saw a panel on uh, you know, religion and ecology. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's where I belong. Wow. That's, those are my people. Yeah. You know? So I used frequent flyer tickets. I stayed with a friend. You know, I had no money as a grad student. And so I just... I was like, I've got to crash that. I've got to go to that panel, you know? And every paper was just, like I was almost in tears hearing those papers. You know, that's where I met Anne Gold. That's where I met Chris Chappell. That's where I met um, a whole bunch of, that's where I met Mary and Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm. And it was like, I found this whole field, just the seed of its beginning. And it was so thrilling for me as a grad student to discover and you know, find my home in the academy in a sense. Um, yeah, and yeah. the work that you were doing really carved out a space for people like me to come along and you know have like an, a job basically. Like there, the idea that there would be positions for people to teach classes of this stuff like that mm. wasn't around back then. And mm. uh, and you know the work that you're doing, including at the University of San Francisco really open that up. Now there's all these young scholars who get to work on the stuff for dissertations and theses and mm -hmm. get to present in these kind of conferences and can mm -hmm. be employed. And uh, so yeah, really, uh, really remarkable trajectory. Yeah. And Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm did just such a profoundly important work that they did. And I am just eternally grateful for their super hard work in the 80s and 90s, you know, to especially the 90s to create those conferences at Harvard University, um, and you know that the Hinduism and Ecology one happened in 97, mm -hmm. so I was deeply honored to be invited to that and be a part of that quilt, and then my chapter, my essay for that conference became a chapter in that book, you know, of Hinduism and Ecology, that Chris Chapel and Mary Evelyn Tucker co-edited. And it's a classic in its field. I mean, all those volumes are like huge, um, you know, they're like beautiful glaciers, although I don't want them to be melting <laughs> when they're solid, right? right. <laughs> so it may not be the best apt metaphor, but um, they're just, they're, they're part, of our, part of our ecosystem, you know, in yeah. a sense. Um, and it's really, um, you know, and so this book is really out of that ecosystem as well, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, it's really a combination of gender and ritual studies and environmental studies. Um, and really also, I mean, I hint, I do a lot of work on the commons, um, on the recovery of the commons and the language of the commons. And so I'm, I'm a bit, um, uh, you know, I'm a scholar, you know, I'm a writer, and I'm also an activist. You know, I've been, you know, I have had my own little tiny, you know, we had a tiny, we have a tiny grassroots 
nonprofit. Um, we call it our backpack nonprofit. You know, <laughs> it's basically just us as volunteers. You know, there's no, you know, there's no staff. We just work with volunteers, and um, but it's really a kind of gift economy work. Um, and so the Friends of the Ganges was a part of that, you know, work uh, back then. And so uh, and so the so this work really started as a seed work um, because it's it's the column bridges one can say between the inside the domestic um, arena of women's ritual powers in Hinduism and then the street you know and the column is a kind of that borderland mm -hmm. you know it's where where that porosity exists um, and so it's it's and it's the edge of in a sense the the you know one aspects of traditional women's ritual powers you know right yeah and this yeah. is just also just beautiful to look at right the designs are just even if you had no idea about the cultural context or ecological significance somebody just shows them to you like oh these are these are really yeah. amazing yeah and and yeah. with a kind of mathematical precision right i know yeah. i mean you already have mentioned some of the fields that you work with you're such an interdisciplinary thinker engineering yeah. economics language and literature religious studies and then also talking about some mathematics as well well, that was really tough. You know, that was because um, I had a dear mentor, C.V. Shishadri, who's really trained. Um, he was the person I went and worked on the internship with on biogas plants and cow dung way back in 81. Um, and he was one of my dearest mentors. He passed away in 95 uh, with a swimming accident in the ocean, but um, in the Bay of Bengal. But, you know, he, in 93, I was on my Fulbright there for the column work and he, you know, I thought we were spending a week in Injambankam on a, at his beach house, you know, as a kind of vacation. But he brought me literally a, a two foot stack of materials he'd been collecting for me on mathematics on the column. And he said, your work will not be completed until you read all this and, you know, put it into your book. And of course I did try and I resisted for many years, but then at some point it was a footnote and then it was a section of the design chapter and it just kept growing. And so, um, and it could easily, I mean, each of these chapters could easily be a book of its own. There's 12 chapters in the book. And I always say there was like 12 dissertations in the column research that I did. You know, there's, I have 12 times as much material. And so it's really something, um, uh, it's an, you know, so the mathematics was stunning because it's the first time, according to Marsha um, Asher, who's an ethnomathematician, um, so that's a combination of anthropology and mathematics. And she said it's the first time, perhaps, that a women's ritual folk art tradition has contributed epistemologically to the, the development of a Western knowledge system such as mathematics and computer science. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's so tremendous. in terms of array grammars, matrices, fractals, um, and also in infinity as well. Mm -hmm. And what I tried to do in my chapter is listen to women's voices and listen to the theoretical computer scientists and mathematicians and try to see where they came together and where they didn't, you know. And one of the things I found was the concept of infinity. Mm -hmm. So the women spoke about that the, the drawing the column was like, drawing a piece of the fold of fabric of infinity mm. and just every wow. morning before sunrise you're drawing this and you're realizing mm. you you do it with the recognition that the that the design goes on forever in the universe mm. wow but for that that moment of drawing and contemplating and meditating and and seeing it you're reminded of that you know, you're reminded of yourself as part of that infinity, you're reminded of this design as part of that infinity, you know, et cetera. And it was just, you know, whereas the mathematicians were more interested in like, how many designs are there? You know, are there an infinite <laughs> number of designs in the, you know, in this particular, yeah. So it was really been interesting. Yeah, so there's a whole mathematics chapter. And then also the, the, the 11th chapter was a real uh, explosion of discovery. I mean, each chapter was a kind of explosion of discovery for me. I mean, explosion is probably too violent of a metaphor, <laughs> but really in terms of intellectual um, insight, you know, I right. would say like almost like fireworks or like, a, you know, a light being shown in the darkness, really, you know, of not knowing what this meant, you know, in, in its fuller sense. And so one of the things for me, that one of the biggest insights was you know, women, and that's why I titled it Feeding a Thousand Souls, is 
women always spoke about like I would ask them the reasons for them to do this column and then they would tell me all these other reasons and for the goddess Lakshmi and for the earth goddess you know Budevi etc which I love which is to honor and recognize all the harm that we do on her every morning so this is really a, 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 a call to her a sign to her to say we we realize we spit on you we poke on you we are destroying you and so this is an offering to you a gift offering to you to that we recognize what we're doing doesn't mean we stop unfortunately right. but <laughs> the dance goes on and at the same time it's this recognition you know um, it's almost like the the you know the the many indigenous traditions you have you honor the hunt mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean you don't hunt you ask for forgiveness to the animal for killing it to be fed but it doesn't mean you stop the hunt right, right, right. so it's the same similar kind of thing um mm. but the women would always say you know then they would softly whisper and they say but the real reason we do the kolam is to feed a thousand souls now because the first ritual act of the day after you brush your teeth is doing this kolam traditionally mm. and so why why that moment why that ritual um, you know, it was to feed a thousand souls. So literally the first ritual act of a Hindu householder should be to feed a thousand souls. And if you're from a very rich merchant caste or a king, you know, Kshatriya caste, you can feed a thousand people, a thousand human souls right. every morning. But if you're a, not a king or a nobleman or noblewoman or, uh, you know, not a, a rich merchant woman um, and you're a regular person, you can still fulfill that dharmic duty mm by making these designs, you make these designs out of rice flour. And the rice flour is literally consumed, it's an edible design. And you can see holes coming through throughout the morning with earthworms and ants and birds and um, small creatures, you know, consuming this rice flour off of the earth. Um, and so, and, but then I, you know, I was not satisfied with that. I thought there's something more to this. You know, and so then I found a footnote after a long search, a footnote in an ancient Sanskrit Dharma Shastra text that spoke about the gravest sin is to for a Hindu householder is to actually build a house. Wow. And so why? Because you are displacing and evacuating and making homeless all the thousands of animal souls that lived in that space where right. you build a house. Right. That just blew my mind. I was just like, what? You know, that is incredible. Yeah. That is, I mean, I have never seen that kind of, or read about that kind of sensitivity. Yeah, to such to small space. creatures, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the text said that there is no way you can make up for that debt no matter how, what good karmic actions you do throughout your life, you have to recognize that this is an immeasurable debt that you owe to these creatures by destroying their homes. And so the least you can do is feed a thousand souls every morning to recognize this grave debt that you have taken on and to remind yourself to act in ways of recognizing that debt. Right, right. So we still have to consume, we still have to use things, but you can do it from that space of recognition yeah. and from that space of knowing that there's there's a debt that we can't pay off, but we can at least acknowledge that problem and, and work toward a kinder, gentler presence on the planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's really mm -hmm. pushed me now. I'm really working a lot more on Hinduism and climate. Mm -hmm. So I'm teaching you know, my Hinduism classes, I've, I mean, the fires that happened in California in the fall of 2017, just, it was like a before and after for me. Um, and so that's when Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico happened, that's where Houston happened. Um, you know, it was, it was just like the, one of the most, like, like just a kind of swath of destruction, you know, um, throughout the United States. And I just, it just was, it, it, you know, I had encountered the, the global climate chaos before personally, 
in different ways, but this was the time that I just, it was like, okay, this is a before and after. Everything I do now in my life has to be toward alleviating the climate crisis. So I thought, what am I doing? And I thought, okay, I'm teaching Hinduism. I'm going to make it Hinduism and climate. You know? <laughs> I mean, not explicitly, but intrinsically. So I'm still yeah. teaching the same texts, but I'm using the texts as a kind of weighing and measuring intellectually of their value as a part of our toolbox, you know, and asking the question, what can a billion Hindus do? Mm, that's a great, you know, great out of question. their toolbox that yeah. could reduce uh, climate chaos. So I'm working on a series of essays around mm. that, you know, and, and, and I sort of think of the classroom as a, you know, I love Saidiya Hartman. I don't know if you know her. She's an incredible thinker and writer and old friend. And she, you know, talks about the classroom as a, as a intellectual lab, right. you know? And so that's how I think of my classes at, at its best, at their best. That's what, that's what they can do. You know, they can, they can that's be great. places where you can think out loud together with your students. And yeah. I just found, I just find USF students amazing and creative and so smart and so thoughtful um, in terms of their willingness to go on this journey with me, you know, mm -hmm. and they're excited too, you know, so it's because they know I'm kind of on the edge of my own thinking. Right, and exactly. So, yeah. So we're all kind of pushing each other together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, yeah. speaking of that, right, because uh, you really do some innovative teaching in a lot of ways. Uh, you mentioned that you teach, you know, a class on the commons. Mm -hmm. That's a class you created. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, I'll kind of talk to the students. I'm like, do you understand how amazing this is? Like, you can't talk about this stuff at any program. Like, a lot of places aren't going to open up a space to talk about that. We'll talk about property and privatization and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we won't talk about reclaiming the commons. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about your work with the commons and how you work with teaching it, how you convey that idea to students. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it was, it came from an essay, two essays that Ivan Illich, who's a philosopher and a deep mentor and teacher and friend of mine and ours. In fact, I met my husband Lee through him. He introduced us. Um, so Illich, I'm, I'm, I'm the receiver of the bounty of many of Yvonne's gifts, you know, um, into personally, intellectually, etc. So he, I met him in 1982, he gave a series of lectures on gender at Berkeley, very controversial series of uh, essays, but I'd run into his work in 81 with my cow dung work. So that's, a, that's a different story. But um, so he had two essays that he did, one was um, unpublished, one was published. The published one was called Silence is the Commons with an old magazine uh, that was called Whole Earth Review, which was really part of the whole counterculture from the 60s and 70s. Um, and it was a fantastic, I, I published various pieces there and you know, later on, but he, he published that and it really, and we've heard him speak about it many times and it was just, it was a, a it was something that again I had not encountered, you know, in my studies at Berkeley. You know, the Commons was just a passing, even Carl Polanyi was just a passing footnote. The Commons wasn't even there. I mean, here I was, my major was political economy of natural resources in the College of Natural Resources, and there was never a mention of the Commons. And there was, of course, the tragedy of the Commons with Garrett Hardin. You know, that was there, but it was again a certain kind of eye. That, that saw and that also occluded. It didn't, it couldn't see a lot, you know, um, it hit a lot. Um, and so it, yeah, so I really, um, that was sort of the seed. And my husband and I decided um, in his other article that was unpublished that he shared with us, it was called Eco Pedagogy and the Commons. And in the last paragraph, he talks about you know, one of the, the most important political work is to recover the commons. Mm. So we decided using that phrase of Illich's to create an organization, a nonprofit organization, um, a 501c3 called recovering the commons, you know, or recovery of the commons. And so we did, and we still, and it's, it's a part also of this, the broader category is called Institute for the Study of Natural and Cultural Resources. And I said, it's just a tiny backpack little, you know, that we just carry on our backs. Right. Um, so, it's, but it's a vehicle, a tool through which we can raise funds to do these kind of innovative, you know, think tanks and conferences and workshops and bring all these varied people who normally wouldn't ever run into each other, you know. 
So there are environmentalist writers like you know Barry Lopez and 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 um, Terry Temples Williams and you know and and then people from India you know like Vandana Shiva you know so we organized a big conference called Gathering of the Tribes in Berkeley and then we took everybody to Mexico to work with Gustavo Esteva in 1987 you know that was when Illich brought Gustavo to our door in 1985 he said you've got to meet Gustavo and you know. And so we worked with Gustavo for many years. You know, we would take groups of people. So they were intellectuals, writers, artists, um, and activists that were from around the world that would normally not have a chance to meet each other. So, you know, we would, you know, raise the funds and bring them together. And we would, you know, do work for 10 days. So Gustavo would take us around for 10 days and show us his recovery of the commons work in Mexico for example. And we'd spend three days with Ivan in Cuernavaca at his, in his village, you know, uh, in Cocopec. So he, you know, he would talk to us for three days about the recovery of the commons. So, um, and then there would be enormous work that would come out of people meeting each other, you know, that would be for lifetime friendships, really. Right, sparks just fly. You get the people together, the friction happens, sparks, creativity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so that's been, um, yeah, so that's been one of the rivers of my work, you know, for the last 36 years, really. Um, and so, and it dipped a little bit, you know, dipped quite a bit when I, I was doing my householder phase with raising my twin daughters, my twin children, I should say, because um, one of them is not a daughter anymore. So I have to, I'm still, my brain is working in the old way. So I've got to, <laughs> <Right. laughs> my kids teach me a lot. So, but they, yeah, so I have, uh, you know, so so two twin children. So they, um, during that time, it was like mainly teaching um, and doing research, but not, I did, couldn't do a lot of activism. But through this book, actually, the last two years, you know, I've done like 60 events, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, public, um, you know, events that were connected to the book, but in various contexts, you know. Um, and so that's been really, really exciting to get back into that work and, so I've done conversations with Amitav Ghosh, you know, uh, for KPFA, um, part of his book launch for Gun Island, which is a brilliant novel about climate and narrative, which I highly recommend. Um, and then uh, Terry Tempest Williams had a new book uh, called Erosion, which I also really recommend. So I did an interview for her for Women's Lit, um, and uh, which is part of the Bay Area Book Festival. Um, and so it's been, um, and then I brought Vandana Shiva to USF and uh, also to KPFA. So twice I did, you know, on conversation interviews with her, um, on stage interviews. So, so, you know, that's just been, it's like bringing my, all my worlds together now. The book has really enabled that, you know, um, and I'm working on a bunch of different books on recovery of the commons and an edited volume of some of the activist work that we did and the intellectual work that we did from 84 to 2002 and updating it as well. So bringing together kind of what is the, you know, what is a series of essays, like say 12 to 15 essays that you need to know to have, to be able to work with the idea of the commons as a, as a kind of living metaphor in your own life. You know, how do you recognize the line of the, where the commons exists? and how the commons is being affected. So, but at the, at the level of the psyche even too. So that's something I'm working on and the Hinduism and climate I'm working on. And I'm also working on a double autobiography of my mother and I, wow. and looking at, you know, faith, immigration and climate issues actually in that too, wow. of energy, you know, sort of the, the embodiment of energy. How does, mm. how does this transformation of the industrial machine how does it live through two women's lives oh that's great you know, no, that's gonna they, be a good one how have they experienced it so mm. i think you know the commons is something that's just so close to my heart and i remember when i proposed it to environmental studies faculty initially like in the early 2000s people were like well you know why do we need a class on the commons you know um and i just it took some years actually you know i mean not continuous but you know it was one of the projects i was working on to persuade people, you know, to make the commons one to offer the class and then to make it a required course for all environmental studies majors, which as far as I know, I think is the only one of the, the only place in the world that does that. 
Um, I know one place in India, a Gandhian university that's teaching a class on the commons in political hmm. science, oh. but it's not a required course. It should be a required course for political science. Right. I think. You think, <laughs> Can imagine if yeah. there are political scientists who were trained in, in yeah. the commons. And, you yeah. know, my students always say to me, like once they start getting the, the sort of amazing capacity of the, of the, of the concept of the commons to hold the questions and the tensions of our age, you know, um, they're like, how come we're not taught this in nursery school? Right. You know, if everybody in the world was, I mean, of course, traditional cultures did teach about the commons. Yeah. You know, it's really our modern industrialized framework that excludes and cannot see the commons, right? It's invisible to its eye, to its gaze. So, um, you know, there's, I think that's one of my other projects is too, is to try to figure out how to, I offer my students, I'm like, I'll work with you, you know, if you want to do a book on the comments for middle school. Or, and actually Ooh, that's great. students, you know, have come forward and I have a couple of students who want to work with me on that, you know, in the spring. Oh, so that's really exciting. Great. Yeah. Oh, so geez. I think, I just think that that concept and it's, it's not, it's not um, containable. Mm -hmm. That concept is not, you know, and we have, of course, Eleanor Ostrom who won a Nobel prize in that field, you know, and she's done the most to kind of, make a much more nuanced understanding of the commons. Yeah, that there's not just one way the commons shows up. There's just yeah. so many ways. It's totally yeah. this open-ended, boundless yeah. idea. Yeah. 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 And I think it's a very exciting time right now, Sam. I, I mean, I feel it in my students at USF. Um, I think we are going through, as far as I can tell, a kind of radical revolutionary potential moment of time. I mean, which is exactly what we need to be doing right now. Yeah. you know, like the 60s and 70s. So I, I think that there's, um, I don't know, I think this is a very exciting moment to be alive. Yeah, that's yeah. that's great. And to be potentially dead too. <laughs> We're all <laughs> part of that, you know, part of that continuum. We don't know when that'll happen. <laughs> that's true, right? Yeah, and that that unpredictability really comes into focus when things are so, uh, so tumultuous. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, well, geez, I could just go on uh, forever. I really, I always learn from hearing your stories, but I'm also just enthralled and entertained. You have you know so many interesting scholars, you've done so much activism, so many interesting teaching things. Uh, so I wonder, I don't know, to leave us with one thought. Um, one of the things you do at the University of San Francisco is also teach internships, right? And so yes, it's yes, kind of yes. the last thing before students are out into the world. Yes. And one of the things I'm very envious of, because sometimes I'm like, I mostly know how to read books and articles, mm -hmm. uh, but you have all these connections with so many different people. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can say something to us by way of teaching, especially during these times, so tumultuous, right? Pandemic climate change, right? Just so many different issues that we're all dealing with. Yeah, um, yeah. So how, are you still finding the strength or the passion and inspiration? And how are you helping the students kind of find that too uh, during these kinds of times, right? To not just have these as ideas, but like your internship does, how to bring it into the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one of the things for me is, you know, having been an activist, you know, um, and I also, I graduated in 1983, which was the worst year of a recession since the depression so I even though it's nothing compared to what the students are going through now but at the time it felt like the bottom of the world right like we were hitting the bottom and so mm -hmm. I think I had to survive I had to figure out you know I did six months of physical labor I did six months of intellectual labor because I'd work at friends of the earth but I only get paid five hundred dollars a month mm -hmm. And so if I worked at a physical job at a factory, well, you saw that article, you know, about the Illich thing that had the factory part. So if I worked six months and I'd get $1,500 a month. So if I saved $500 a month during the physical work days, then I, and if I limited my needs to $1,000 a month, you know, which you could do if you lived really simply in the eighties, you know. Uh, and so, you know, I think that having had that experience, you know, and that commitment to that way of life, it's like inside my body, right? Mm -hmm. And so I un really understand when students want to take these ideas and, and embed them in community life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that the ache and that desire, you know, I, I am a sister to that. You know, I am, I, I've lived through that. And 
um, you know, I came to the academy quite late, you know, in my like late 30s, mid to late 30s, you know, so I'm not one of those straight shooters. I didn't, you know, do grad school and then, you know, go into, you know, um, and so, and I had gone to grad school to become a better activist, you know, but then I ended up, you know, getting, you know, I wanted to have children and I needed to have health insurance. So it was like, okay, I need to get a job. You know? So that's what put me into, you know, into the academy. And I'm very grateful, you know, these last 23 years have been amazing at USF. Um, I think that for me, I always say this in my little introductions is I see myself as a matchmaker, you know, as a matchmaker between the, the students kind of emotional intellectual sensibilities and what the emotional intellectual sensibilities and activist sensibilities of an organization might be. So what I tend to, what I do is I interview, you know, in fact, I'm doing, I'm going to be doing this um, in the early part of January is interviewing every student that's in my class, you know, like a deep interview, like 30 minutes to an hour, which is a long time to get to know someone, you know, in terms of their dreams and their desires and how they want to serve the world. You know, really what is there? And sometimes they don't know. Like they just want to serve, but they're not sure. And that's okay yeah, too, right. because then you, you, you help them figure out how do you try these different clothes on, you know? Mm -hmm. So just think of it as a kind of like you're, you're going out into the world and you're trying these different, you know, are you a poncho person? Are you a jacket person? Are you, what are you, you know? Right. And you have to try it. And sometimes what might look like failure is actually a success because even if the internship doesn't work, like my internship, you know, in India was a total tough, you know, I had the mm -hmm. toughest, not Cheshadri, but his supervisor under him, mm -hmm. that was my direct supervisor was really mean, you know, but it really fired up my anger and rage at him to the point where I stretched myself to do things when I got back to Berkeley that I wouldn't have done. So I saw his meanness then in the long term as a tremendous gift. You know, his cruelty was a, was a gift in a weird way, you know, because he, he made me feel so low you know, that I was like, okay, I know I'm not that low. I'm going to show you how, you know, gonna, you know. so yeah, I think yeah. I, you know, I, you just never know how it's going to work in your life. And so I guess part of the internship class to me is really sharing those stories of struggle with my students and making them like one of my students um, who graduated, you know, and, and we're still in touch and, and, you know, she's working in the sunrise movement. In fact, you know, now I'm so proud of her and she took on, I've had now alumni of my internship class helping current students in my internship class. Wow. So that's, that's starting great. to happen, which is really sweet, you know. Mm. But she, I remember, said to her, said to me a very profound thing. She said, you know, she's a professor in graduate class was very important for me, the internship class. And she'd taken other classes with me too, but she said, this class was really important because it taught me the adventure of work. Mm. That's a great way to put it. She taught me that it's not that mm -hmm. there's like a destination that I'm a train station I'm going to. Mm -hmm. And if I don't get there, I'm a failure. But it's really that the journey, that the, your work journey, your life work journey is something that's a dialectic between you and the world. And it unfolds every single month. It's still unfolding for me. I'm not done, you know. Like I'm folding the Institute and my activism work back in the last two or three years, you know, last three years, really, you know, in a way that, you know, that I couldn't for 15 years, right? right? right. As a mother of twins. And so, and, and as a professor, so like I couldn't like, you know, so now they're off to college and then I could do that work, you know? Right. So I think it's, it's, you know, keeping alive also, I tell my students, you can't do, you can have many dreams. You can't do them all at the same time. So right. you just have to know you have, if you're really lucky, you may have 60 years after you're 20. Mm -hmm. And you can do all those things over that 60 year period. Yeah. Yeah. Try on the yeah. other outfits later. Yeah. 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 Just keep that dream there. Keep it as a bowl on the shelf. Mm. Rem remember, you know, you have that and keep putting things in there, you know, that you learn or think, oh, that might be useful later, you know. Wonderful. Jeez, yeah, so that's I think a, that's where, perfect. yeah, so I feel like that's, I mean, I guess part of it is just passing it forward, you know, to me, like, I feel like mm -hmm. so many people gave me so many gifts of knowledge and um, attention and uh, energy, you know, 
Mm-hmm. Um, Shakti said that I just feel like if I can pass on a, a, a small portion of that to my students, you know, that they carry on and they pass forward to whoever they run into, then that's, that's my work, you know. That's great. That's a great uh, note to end on. I think it brings it back really full circle, right? That your work very much like the Kolam is about feeding a thousand souls, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah. bring that energy forward and, and continuing to uh, keep our dreams alive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So geez, thank you so much for uh, for being on here. I'll have to have you back sometime, we hear more stories and as you make more progress on some of these other projects, teaching mm-hmm. and activism, education, and uh, the personal life, professional life, just so many things weaving together. To me, this is what the field of religion and ecology is really all about. Mm-hmm. Uh, so thanks yeah. so much for being here. Yeah. And thank Nagarajan. you for being you. Thank you for being you. <laughs> thank you for making this happen. You're very welcome. Yeah, That's yeah. it's hard for me not to. <laughs> <laughs> well, geez, and thanks to everybody uh, for tuning in. And yes, uh, we'll uh, we'll definitely be back with uh, more stuff for you next week. In the meantime, take care and be well. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>